Servant of God, well done. When hast thou fought the better fight? Good morning. This is Nelson Olmsted. Some time ago in my Saturday night short story program, I told a tale by Richard Coleman which created an unusual amount of interest among listeners. Since then, we've had request after request for a repetition of it. So here again is the narrative of a little Irish orphan who is taught to stand up and fight his own battles. It's entitled, Fight for Sister Joe. Sister Joseph reached into her great bottomless pocket and took out her signal, a wooden prayer book that gave a loud clack when its two halves were snapped shut. You will please take your arithmetic books and work the fifth, eighth, and tenth problems in short division on page 29. There was a flipping of pages, and the struggles against problems fifth, eighth, and tenth began. The room was still, but you could almost hear the creakings and strainings of minds that were still a little stiff because they were rather new. Eddie chewed on the red rubber eraser of his pencil. It broke away, and he chewed it meditatively as he wondered how many times seven went into 37. Should be even with a seven on the end of it. The eraser crumpled in his mouth. He chewed the dry little bits of rubber thoughtfully until he saw Sister Joseph's eyes upon him. In sudden fright, he swallowed hard. Sister Joseph would make the seat of his pants smoke from a ruler if she thought he'd been chewing gum in his mouth. He worked frantically, writing seven and 37 all over his paper. He knew she was still watching him. And when he dared to look up again, she was reaching into the voluminous pocket for a little red demerit book. Eddie thought it must be wonderful to have two pockets as big as Sister Joseph had. She carried almost as much stuff as the little fellows in her class. You could never be sure of what she would take out one of them pockets next. There was always a clean, large gray check workman's handkerchief in one of the pockets, the wooden prayer book that was a signal a little pencil sharpener that Eddie himself had bought for her from the ten-cent store at Christmas, in which Reverend Mother had allowed her to keep as her own. And she had a box of Smith Brothers cough drops for any boy who was lucky enough to strangle sufficiently to need one. And once she'd taken from her pocket a little bag of gumdrops and given them to Eddie when he'd washed down the blackboard and beat the erasers until his hair was white with chalk dust and his hands felt dry and hard. And when a boy gave Sister Joseph an apple, orange, or pear... She thanked him and dropped it into one of the great pockets where it was lost. There was no bulge, no curving outline of the apple among all the other treasures. Eddie watched Sister Joe write his name in the demerit book for eating in class. It was tough to have to write ejaculations a hundred times for eating a dried-up eraser, but there wouldn't be any use telling her that it wasn't candy or anything good. Eraser or not, he'd eaten it. For almost an hour after school, he would have to scrawl, Mother of Christ, teach me to obey. Eddie remembered the nuns who'd been his first three teachers. When he'd been brought to the convent as an orphan to be kept until his elementary education was complete and then returned to his guardian, he was ready for the kindergarten. The next few years, sisters Rabona, Teresa, and Veronica had put the fear of the Lord into him. And when he came to the third grade, he wondered what Sister Joseph would be like. He'd watched her in the play yard. Once he'd actually seen her pick up a ball that had rolled at her feet while she was saying a breviary and throw it back deftly and surely to a delighted group of little boys. They said she was regular. Didn't everybody call her Sister Joe? Oh, not to her face, of course. A mortal sin would not have been eyed less askance than such a thing as calling one of God's religious by a nickname. But to all the boys who passed through the third grade, she was Sister Joe. Somehow, she seemed like one of them. And yet she never lost that inspiring distance that lay between her and any layman, and was greater still between her and those worthless little hooligan boys. Eddie loved Sister Joe with all the love in his small Irish heart. She was Irish, too. And when you asked her, with a great show of respect, of course, where she was from, she invariably answered, From County Kerry, Lord Help Us. Eddie, like the other boys, thought that the Lord Help Us was part of the name. Benny Cavanaugh told his mother one day that Sister Joseph was from a funny place in the old country called County Kerry, Lord Help Us, (laughs) and didn't know why his mother was always repeating the story. To Eddie, Sister Joe was more than regular. She was wonderful. Because Eddie was an orphan and didn't have a loud, cheery Irish home to go to, 
but had to live in a little room in the convent. Sister Joe had helped to make a pencil box. And when it was through, she asked what kind of a picture he wanted painted on the lid. And he asked her to help him decide. She didn't think of a thing religious. And it ended up by painting five lively little monkeys clinging by long arms or curling tails to a green limb. She wasn't less religious than the other nuns. Anybody could see that. When Eddie watched the procession of nuns going into the chapel for Vespers, he looked for plump, stubby little Sister Jo. Her face was bright and holy when the spatter of light from the altar candles fell on her. Eddie's heart bumped love as he saw her take her place beside tall, lean Sister Rabona in steamboat Sister Veronica. After problems 5th, 8th, and 10th had been worked to yield some 20 answers from 30 boys, the bell rang for mid-morning recess. The prayer book clacked, the boys slid from benches, filed out decorously, alert after having been drugged with arithmetic. At the door, they broke into a wild, screaming mass. Oh, Comanches, muttered Sister Joe at the doorway. A tribe of wild Comanches. She went to get her glass of cold milk and a piece of bread with jam. The Comanches seemed wilder than ever as their piercing screams came through the high latticed windows. She put down her glass of milk and listened carefully. Instinctively, she felt a little thrill of excitement when she realized that there was a fight going on. From the sound of it, a good fight. She ate her last bit of bread hurriedly, drank the milk lest it be wasted, and hurried down the corridor. She stopped at the door to take in all the details so that punishment would go to every boy that deserved it. And she caught her breath sharply when she saw what was going on inside the ring of howling boys. Rick Mulhall, a big boy in the fifth grade, was beating her own Eddie unmercifully. Now, all the boys fought when the time came, but Eddie just put up his poor, skinny arms in an effort to save himself. No one had ever seen him take his arms down long enough to strike out once against another boy. He wasn't yellow exactly. He could take it, but that was his trouble. Always, Eddie stood up and took it. Now, Sister Joe loved Eddie, not just because he didn't have a good Irish mother as he should have had, but because there was something about him that stirred her love as well as her sympathy. She tried to hide her love from the community and from the boys and from Eddie himself. She was positive her secret was her own. Silently, she moved toward the flowing ring of children. Benny Cavanaugh looked toward the door at that moment and gave the word. The ring broke, spread in all directions. Rick Mulhall hurriedly started a game and hit the stick. Eddie stood there, thankful for whatever had ended his beating. He didn't cry, but whimpered a little because no one was watching him now. He rubbed his arm across his face and then saw the soft-looking high-topped shoes peeping from beneath the black robe and the gravel in front of him. Was it Sister Teresa who would box him harder than Rick had? Or was it Sister Veronica who would make his heart stand still by her freezing look? He took his arm slowly away from his face and looked up. He didn't have to look up as far as he would have had had it been Sister Rabona. Would you like a glass of milk and a bit of bread and jam, Eddie? Said Sister Joe slowly. He followed her, carefully spitting into his handkerchief and wiping his grimy face. She washed his face herself in the refractory sink. He ate the soft, fresh bread that Sister Philomene had baked that morning and sort of breathed in the tart lumps of damson jam. He closed his eyes while he drank the cold, sweet milk. And when he opened them, he sighed a little at Sister Joe's back over by the china shelf. After the lunch hour recess, Sister Joe rapped Benny Cavanaugh on the head with her wooden prayer book because he didn't know the feast days, and it made such a loud crack that Eddie thought she must have split the soft wood. Benny rubbed his head gingerly. He knew that he'd not got that lick because he could think of only the ascension, Christmas, and circumcision. At that, he'd got off light. Sister Joe had given him the ruler across the knuckles because he'd given Rick Mulhall a signal when he should have helped his own classmate. Now, Sister Joe was a staunch third grader herself, and wanted all her boys to be. She didn't hate a fight as much as she made out, but she hated to see a third grader get the worst of it. After school, Eddie waited to be told that he would have to stay and write a hundred ejaculations for eating the eraser. As the boys marched out, he felt her hand on his shoulder and he stepped out of line. But Sister Joe wasn't thinking of ejaculations. She hesitated before she started to talk when they were alone. She wanted to reach him to talk to him the way his father would have talked to him if he'd not been dead. At last she said, You're an Irishman, Eddie. There are some things an Irishman just doesn't do. When he says he's in for a fight, he puts up his fists and goes at it as fiercely and proudly as if he were fighting for the old side itself. Now, I don't want you to be a bully, a boy who, who starts fights. 
But I do want you to be man enough to finish one when a fight is forced on you. All this is our secret, Eddie. No one else is to know about it but you and me. Your dear father's dead, God rest his soul. But if he were living, he'd teach you the way I'm going to teach you. I'm going to be your mother and your father. That's our secret. In class, I'm just your teacher, and you're just a pupil. But in everything else, you'll find me on your side, if you're right. Now, the first thing I've got to teach you is this. She doubled the rosary up into the worn leather cincture so that it wouldn't get in the way. She rolled back her great sleeves, planting her small feet firmly on the ground, and held her fists under her nose. And when Eddie got over his amazement, he laughed at Sister Joe dancing about in the soft old high-top shoes, thrusting and parrying, urging him to put up his hands and fight. Every day after school, they practiced. The plump, stubby little nun with her full black skirt swishing about her, and the little boy standing up to her with his thin little arms fighting for an opening. At every recess, she gave him milk and bread with butter and sugar or preserves. And every day, she taught him that an Irishman doesn't stand and take it, but fights back proudly and righteously as a man should. She made a punching bag out of an old gingham apron that belonged to Sister Wardrobe and that had been filled with sand. He could hit it hard. She hit him, but he seldom hit her. She was too quick for him. At first, he was overcome at the thought of having struck a nun. But Sister Joe laughed at him and urged him on by a smart clip to the cheek. He watched fights in the yard and learned from them, too. It was over a month before a fight of his own was thrust upon him. Terry McGovern, of the fourth grade, decided it was time for Eddie to have another licking. Once he'd started the fight, Terry couldn't very well back out, but he soon wished he could. The boys crowded around screaming encouragement to Eddie when they saw the smaller boy putting up a real fight. The sister Joe had listened every day for a fight. She peeped from behind the ferns in the music room to see if it were Eddie this time. And when she saw it was, she rolled up her sleeves and watched excitedly. Eddie took a lot of punishment, but he put Terry onto his knees and beat him properly. He looked at the music room window and caught a glimpse of a bobbing white coif and a plump face encircled with white and black. His heart beat wildly. She'd seen him. He hated to stop. He couldn't hit Terry now that he'd said enough and was down, so he looked around threateningly. He saw Rick Mulhall in the ring and pushed aside the boys near him. His thin little arm shot out in one clean, hard blow that brought the blood running out of Rick's nose. The big boy was so surprised, and the blow had stung him so that he didn't even put up his hands to strike back. Eddie waited until it was plain that Rick had no fight in him, and then ran headlong to the door of the convent. Sister Joe met him in the corridor from the music room. She snatched him up to her, and his forehead felt the cool, hard, immaculately white coif. His cheek felt a rough, heavy black habit and beneath the soft, sweet bosom. He held tight and ached with love. This has been Richard Coleman's short story, Fight for Sister Joe, as told by Nelson Armstead, who has a closing word. Next week, our program will be heard a half hour earlier. For the past four weeks, we presented some of our favorite short stories. We wanted to find out what you think of a program of this sort in the morning. We'd like to hear from you, not only to know that you're listening, but to find out which stories have been your favorites. So if you have the time, drop us a line. Until Monday morning, then, at our new time, good morning and good reading. Monday through Friday, NBC presents America's master storyteller, Nelson Amstead, and his world's greatest stories. Remember, starting Monday next week, Nelson Amstead will be heard a half hour earlier, and we suggest that you consult the radio column in your newspaper so that you do not miss a single one of the fine tales he has to tell you. Be sure to listen and tell your friends to listen to Nelson Amstead. This is the National Broadcasting Company.